so the Crimson Cluster was formed uh, based on the observation that like Maker has uh, this very, very like killer product, which is dye. Um, but we are missing uh, certain uh, markets that exist elsewhere in the ecosystem. So Crimson wants to take these existing uh, products and vertically uh, integrate them under Maker such that Dai is a first class citizen and we're sort of we're supporting the Maker ecosystem as a whole. Yes, sir. Another episode of Drinks with Maker Dow Delegates. On today's show, we have some special individuals. First, we got to do our dance. <laughs> Good to have uh, Big Papa Raphael. Today's show, we have a very special guest, none other than Sam McPherson of the Crimson Cluster, which is the new MakerDAO end game plan cluster. If you haven't heard, uh, you need to catch up because this is something super exciting that's happening right now in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Welcome to the show, Sam. How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, good to be here. Terrific, man. I know it's a tough week. Uh, but I'm so happy that we got back uh, Raphael, Papa Raphael, what I'm going to start calling him now. Uh, how's it going, Raphael? It's going good, actually. I was on a two-week vacation because um, my second child was born. Uh, good! Father! <laughs> father! Oh, my God! You got some more gray hair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just getting started, you. <laughs> um but actually the amazing th thing was that i had like i don't know if you, if you if you guys had a baby but like in the first weeks months like they sleep a ton right like 16 18 20 hours a day and so i had a lot of time to read and um i read a lot of stuff that i kind of pushed on the back burner for a year or so like a book about holacracy and uh some org dev stuff and it was just like finally great to just have these input again of like hey actually we can zoom out and, and look from a little bit of a distance and then develop new ideas and so that i was i was really grateful for that opportunity so yeah but it feels good to be back especially with with the two of you and with sam here and i'm really looking forward to, to talk to you yeah well, 100 man actually that book that you mentioned there i think it actually ties back into the uh end game plan so we'll we'll get into that in a bit uh, glad you read that book and not the um, effective altruism book that uh, certain people from FTX, are, but I won't go there, are reading right now. But hey, Tim, what's going on? I see you're at uh, some fireplace back there that you have burning. Are you uh, going skiing already? No, it's uh, it's winter is coming. It's not only crypto winter, it's really winter is coming. So I finally got approval from my, my wife that I can light up this thing again. So for the next, I don't know, at least three or four months, it will be on all day all night uh heating up the whole house um yeah to to yeah to get some more space for new woods to be to be cut uh in this winter as well so <clears throat> but it's not really reference to to crypto winter to be honest i i have to admit i'm i'm kind of surprised by myself that this i mean you already teased that a bit the the markets that are that we see this week they should make me sad or whatever but i'm just numb i think i don't i don't give anything about this it's just takeout season time to time to rebuy uh and wait another year or two or ten or whatever so time time to build for sure and speaking of building uh today's guest is a builder uh one of the um one of the things i think about when i think of sam mcpherson is how lucky our community the maker dow community is to have them because I think any community would have been lucky to, to get this individual, right? I remember him from back uh, 2018, uh, winter, speaking of winter, the 
Uh, some people call that the second winter of crypto, and now we're heading into the third. But I remember Sam, you know, he was just a regular community member like myself and like you, uh, Tim. Um, and, you know, happy to have you, man. Uh, so with that in mind, Sam, what what motivated you to stick around with the Maker community? What did you see in the community and also the MakerDAO protocol that you know, allowed you to put your head down and eventually join protocol engineering. Uh, appreciate that, Frank, uh, the kind words. Um, yeah, I guess uh, to go back to 2018, it feels like an eternity ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I really originally got into Maker uh, because like uh, it was the ICO, the 2017 ICO phase. And uh, I'm sure you remember all the absolute nonsense <laughs> that was out there. So first sort of project that was like, oh, this, I can really get behind this was the, it was Ethereum. And then on top of that, I was looking for projects that made sense. And, you know, here in the sea of insanity was a project that, you know, had, you know, cash flows and profit mechanisms and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, initially it was just a hobbyist investment. Um, but yeah, uh, you say you were around at that time too, Frank. You know, you remember 2018? It was a very uh, close niche little group uh, we were having out in Maker, and it was it was a lot of fun. We rode that bear market for two years and just you know uh, messed with the stability fees. That was like the only option uh, we could uh, play around with at the time. Um, yeah, just moving the stability fees up and down in those weekly uh, votes. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, why did I stick around? Like, I just, I love the project. I think that's, that's it, right? So um, I believe in the mission. I got on board with the vision and uh, like, I'm, I'm here to stay. I'm here for the long run. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, if you turn back the clock and you turn it forward, you, you've made the right decision, right? Because since 2018, so many protocols have either uh, disappeared, rugged, or, <laughs> been hacked unfortunately or they're just uh still trading somehow some way as crypto never seems to go to zero so um i think you you obviously have the smarts to understand that the protocol had a an amazing concept of, of building a permissionless decentralized stable coin so here we are today uh but with that in mind man this is drinks with maker Dow delegates thank you for for coming on on board and we have this tradition here that we kick off the show uh, with a morning drink, unfortunately, in the U.S. and in Canada and uh, in the uh, on the other side of the world, in the East, in Europe, these guys usually get drunk. So what, what are you drinking today, Tim? So I, I actually had a hard time because last week I promised that next time I'll bring alcohol again. But I don't have any beer in my fridge that I haven't uh, showed here. And I don't want to bring the, the same drink twice. Um, and then Raphael said that he's going to have some, some tea for, for mothers for breastfeeding. There's this ugly tea that's supporting mothers for breastfeeding. Um, yeah, mm, good stuff. Not, not really good stuff. But it has anise in it. Is that the, the English term for it? I'm not sure. Anise, you mean? Anise, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and that reminded me that I actually have some ouzo left. A uh, very special ouzo from, mm. from a small town in, in Greece, uh, Leonidio. And it's, it's an ouzo that you can cannot buy as an individual. They, it's a small distillery. They only do it for restaurants uh, nearby. But I liked it so much when I was there, I think two years ago, that I basically asked uh, the bartender if he would be fine with selling me a bottle of it. So I brought, I brought an old Campari bottle, a little one, the big one for sure. And he filled it up with, with some ouzo from there. It's not much left there. Um, and just half an hour ago, I put a little shot of that into the freezer. It's it's cold enough already. It's already still not that milky anymore, but it's really really cold. So this is this is the stuff I'm going to have. And you're That's not going winter. to have alcohol again, right, Frank? You, you uh, have coffee well, again. I, actually, I I wanted to join you because last week I you let me down and I had wine and you had uh, some grape juice yes. uh, from yeah. Germany. <laughs> But I got this special beer that's in my fridge for a while, and I'm, I'm afraid to open it, but Game I'm going to give Thrones. it up. Game of Thrones, special edition. Wow. Uh, it was sold the um, the month that the last episode, you know, the closing episode came came around, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but um, 
yeah, it comes uh, three in a box, but unfortunately the only one I have left, because this was, remember the last show was like three years ago, I think, before pre-pandemic. Um, so this is called Take the Black Stout. I'm going to open this, and while I'm doing that, it's from a, it's from a brewery, by the way, named uh, Umagang, which is one of the best brewers in uh, the United States for uh, small brewers. Uh, outside of New York, about two two hours, no, actually four hours away from here. So while I'm doing this, uh, Sam, what are you what are you drinking? What's our special guest guest drinking today? Um, I have a very exciting uh, coffee that may or may not have something else in it. Oh, mm. that's Irish coffee. Maybe. <laughs> All right, that's I did. Uh, it's a but secret, yeah, just, just like a developer. But it, but yeah, it's yeah, a zero knowledge it's coffee. Zero knowledge proof. If you're trying, yeah, yeah there you go. Need. <laughs> what, what about you, uh, Rafael? Papa Rafael, you got this special drink. I know you're supporting uh, your wife there. Yeah, so. I have that. Um, I don't know if you can see. Wait a second. Um, okay, here it is. Ooh, look at that. So it's a tea and it's a fandle aniseed and it's uh, supposed to help mother's breastfeed. Uh, actually, I like fandle tea a lot. I know Tim doesn't, but um, for me, it's very nice. It's, it's good in the stomach. It's warming. So I'm having that. Um, also, like I checked my beer fridge and like Tim, I have like 15 bottles of Tegernseer, which I already had like four shows back. And obviously, bringing the same drink twice is an absolute no-go. So here we go. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Enjoy. Hey, here's here's to the uh, to the ecosystem, the industry surviving uh, another crypto winter, right? Another cheers to you all. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but yes. Ooh, it's a stout. This is nice. This is actually like um, like a cup of coffee early in the morning. Yeah, it gets you going. So I'm gonna yeah, give it. Yeah, give it a three three point eight. I'm gonna do a, a Kurt Barry move and give it like an odd number and say it's three point. I should say three point seven. Three point seven. There we go. What about you, Tim? Uh, so I'm. I haven't had this for. I don't know. Um, I usually just drink uzo in, in summer, and I think this summer I, had, I haven't had any uzo. So it's kind of kind of new to me again. But it, it's it's like bringing exactly back the same flavor that I had two years ago in Greece. So it's it's really colorful. Um, it's it's not tasting like the standard ouzo you can get from the supermarket, um, and I'm actually surprised because it's it is as good as it was two years ago when I was in Greece because this yeah this bonus that you have when you're on vacation this usually wears off when you're home so um, yeah this Uzo. is it's an ouzo I think it's a it's a four point seven three what <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 4.73 all right so now we're doing like you know every 10 basis points every three basis points uh sam i know you got that ckp uh cup of coffee that actually would be a great name for a cafe ckp cafe imagine that you come in there you kind of like uh you know do a zero knowledge proof that you bought the coffee before you got there you get served the uh, damn coffee and then like nobody knows what the hell you're drinking and they have and in order for you to prove that you're drinking that you kind of tell them like one ingredient of the coffee without revealing the whole ingredient, so it can be exactly. Never mind. Okay, I have no <laughs> idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sam, what, what 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 do you got there? What zero knowledge proof can you give us? Yeah, I mean, I like this idea for the zero knowledge coffee shop. <laughs> Should definitely uh, start this up. Um, yeah, I'm assuming this is out of five. Uh, it's <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. It's like two out of five. I've had. It's, it's okay. I've had way better coffee, though. It's just made at home. Sounds like you needed to put some more Jameson in there, man. Something. Yeah, or just uh, mirror you guys, 2.13. 2. Let's, let's 2.13. Just a little bit. But, but is this the usual coffee you have at home, or is it just a special brand of, I don't know? Just usual. There's nothing special. But that's the one you usually have every day? Uh, no. I mean, uh, I go to the office. I have an office machine. I'm not at okay. the office. Right now. And that's better, I hope. Uh, it's <laughs> the same. I mean, I don't know. Just coffee you have every day kind of stuff. Okay. You should a treat personal... yourself with a better one, I think. Yeah, yeah for I mean, sure. The problem with coffee, though, is if you have the same, I think, I feel like if you get good coffee and then you're like, oh, I'm going to go get that consistently every day, it kind of just 
gets less interesting over time because you're having it all the time. So good coffee is always new coffee, I guess. Uh, Raphael, what, what, what about you? You got that special potion for uh, folks that, that are, you know, they're in the grind, man. Not only are you in crypto, but you're also taking care of the baby 24-7 along with your wife. So what, what does that drink do for you? Does, does it do any wonders? Five star, four star? So I'm going to give it a 3.1415 star. Oh, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah, it's actually, it's decent tea. Like I've, I've had way better tea, um, but it's warm. I like the family taste. So here we go. Terrific. And I'll hit you up for the exact uh, ingredients of that uh, special potion you got there. Because, uh, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't quite register everything Absolutely. that made up that tea. Um, but all right, look, we have a lot of exciting things to talk about with our special guest today, Sam McPherson, a.k.a. Hexanaut. Um, but we're also in the middle of a tough week. Today is Thursday, November 10th. Uh, I believe we are actually having a positive day finally. It's been such a rough week. Uh, Ethereum is trading, or ETH, as some people like to call it, is trading at 1331 spot 62 U.S. dollars. Uh, Maker Dow, man, it, this thing is sizzling hot, but not financial advice, uh, but it's looking good. It's at 838 this morning, um, MKR. So things have turned around. We got a very nice number from the consumer price index. It looks like uh, this is the lowest print uh, rise in price prices for consumers' goods in the last, uh, I believe, nine months. I think January was the last time we had a print this, this low. So uh, hopefully inflation is going away. Uh, but we also had a rough market. Let's not sugarcoat it just because Maker is back at 800 plus. Uh, it's been a rough week, right? We had the fallout of FTX, uh, which is a centralized exchange uh, located overseas outside of the European <laughs> Union and also the United States. So I have no idea where they're located. I believe Bahamas. Uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, it's, it's a fallout. Um, we still don't know what's going on there. It seems like they're insolvent and they need to raise capital. Uh, we got the news yesterday that uh, CZ of Binance, which is another centralized exchange, is not able to um, bail them out, for lack of a better word. I mean, what do you guys think of all this? What do you make of this? And how far back is this incident, or I, I don't know if I should call it an incident, but this crisis going to push back the ecosystem? Sam, why don't you uh, give us your thoughts of what has happened over the last 72 hours? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit it. it was surprising to me. I was put, I mentally had FTX as sort of not the type of folks who were messing around uh, with whatever they've done. You know, they had this giant hole in their books. So clearly they were doing something they shouldn't have. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it really caught me off guard. Even, even when there was all these things going down, uh, I think I sent a message uh, to my like office crypto. Everybody's like, oh, what's going on here? And I'm like, there's no way they're insolvent. I mean, uh, and then like I literally one minute later, there was, um, I forget which tweet it was, but it basically saying they were uh, distressed and they were um, selling to Binance or whatever that tweet was, something around then. And so, yeah, ate my words almost immediately. So yeah, it's definitely not great. I'm not rooting for any of these exchanges to go bust. You know, these are people's funds and livelihoods. So uh, it's it's not good. I'm, yeah. Yeah, it was a very, uh, very painful uh, Tuesday night, which is two nights ago or on Thursday today. Uh, I couldn't couldn't fall asleep myself, man. It was it was tough. Uh, but uh, Tim, uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. But to be honest, it's just another proof that not your keys, not your crypto. So you shouldn't have your life savings there. You should use them to on an off ramp. And that's it. And then if you if you don't want to go into crypto, you go into die, and then you provide to the DSR and gain some yields over time. That's the way to go. So if you don't have, so if you just have your your crypto on a centralized exchange, I mean, I do feel pity for you, but it's it's you can avoid that. It's I mean, that's the whole the the whole idea of this thing that we can avoid middlemen's like central exchange exchanges. Um, I totally get that, that we need that for on and off ramping, but yeah, that's, that's it. We shouldn't do more there, I think. Yeah, totally. I think, <clears throat> so for me, I mean, the, like central, decentralized players keep 
going past in this like amazingly uh, flamboyant manner. And I don't know. I think it's, it it just shows you that basically what crypto was set out to do is is that people don't have to second guess. Hey, how's the balance sheet doing? But nobody's telling you. You just look on chain and proof is there or it isn't, right? And then you you know what you're dealing with. And clearly that's missing on a centralized exchange. And I think. What we probably see now, and it's probably an interesting uh, proposition for, for MetaDAOs or for Maker, is that what's missing is good on and off ramps. Because the reason why these exchanges got so big in the first place is because I use them all the time to, to, to shuffle fiat to crypto and back, right? I, it's like all the other ways. I, I, I remember in, in 2013 and 14, I was buying Bitcoin and then later in 15 and 16 Ethereum on this local Bitcoin.de where you uh, do a wire transfer to this guy and then maybe or maybe not, he'll send you the, <laughs> the, the private keys of a wallet. And that was painful. It was painful. It took like five to six days to, to, to acquire coins and the price would change in between. So I think we, we need to, as, as a decentralized community, think about how we want to handle that in the future. Otherwise, this is just... It, it, you almost took us back to the Mel Cox days there, man, with the wire transfers and all that good stuff. But... Uh... Yeah, you know, you brought up an interesting point there, the end game uh, plan, MetaDAOs, and, you know, today's guest, Sam, is uh, the founder, uh, for lack of a better word, Sam, or the author, I should say, of the proposal uh, for the Crimson Cluster. Uh, but before we get into the Crimson Cluster, um, Sam, kind of give us your, explain it like I'm five years old, uh, of what exactly is the end game for some of the viewers who might have not heard of the MakerDAO, uh, end game plan. Is that even possible? Seriously, <laughs> Frank, you want me to give a, just a quick uh, e ELI five uh, of the end game? Um, uh, okay, well, I, I don't know if I could do ELI five, but like, I guess th this particular portion, the MetaDAO portion, uh, it's not exactly like splitting Maker into uh, an Alphabet style uh, subsidiary uh, model, but that's sort of the closest analogy that I've been given uh, or giving uh, because like um, it's a new thing. So like you can't really define exactly what a new thing is. You just have to find some things that are pretty close to it and use those as analogies. So I think that's that's the mental model I'm kind of using. Maker is alphabet and uh, MetaDAOs are various uh, subsidiaries such as Google or whatever their uh, longevity one is, you know. They have a whole bunch of companies. Yeah, that's a that's a very good explanation. Another way I like to describe it is uh, a bunch of uh, small little sub DAOs, right? That are um, part of the core maker DAO, uh, surrounded and work uh, pretty much either in tandem or outside the ecosystem. What I mean by that, with other actors who are part of the ecosystem of the environment and kind of have this old circle where the that meta DAOs are in the middle and every the ecosystems on the outside and uh they are servicing the 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 entire ecosystem of each meta DAO. uh but right now it's very early right we don't even have one meta DAO. and i know you're working on a cluster by the name of the crimson cluster uh you author the proposal to the maker DAO community and you kind of give us a uh, simple idea of what exactly is uh your cluster about? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the Crimson Cluster was formed uh, based on the observation that like Maker has uh, this very, very like killer product, which is DAI, um, but we are missing uh, certain uh, markets that exist elsewhere in the ecosystem. So Crimson wants to take these existing uh, products and vertically uh, integrate them under Maker, such that Dai is a first-class citizen, and we're sort of we're supporting the Maker ecosystem as a whole. Our first, uh, I think, a concrete example is is good for this. Um, so right now, Maker has a lending engine uh, that supports depositing collateral and then borrowing Dai against it. Um, we all know this pretty well. Um, but what it's missing is uh, some features that some users want, uh, such as earning higher interest on your collateral by uh, rehypothecating it. So this means lent. So instead of just locking up uh, your ETH and borrowing DAI, you can do that. And then somebody else can borrow your ETH and then pay you an interest rate. Um, so this 
unlocks a whole bunch of other features, uh, such as uh, say you have staked ETH and you want to lever up on the uh, APY that's attached to uh, proof of stake Ethereum staking. Uh, you can then deposit your staked ETH, borrow uh, ETH collateral that somebody else has deposited, deposit that into Lido, and then uh, you get a uh, multiplier on your APY. So this isn't possible in Maker right now. So we want to support a uh, more advanced lending engine such that uh, users in the Maker, Maker ecosystem can get access to these features. Do you do you plan to basically just money Lego uh, existing solutions uh, onto your platform, or are you really building something? Uh, I don't know. It sounds a bit like like the Aave model, for example, that somebody else can borrow the collateral that you were providing. Are you going yeah. to do this on yourself, or are you just going to yeah plug those those existing pieces together? Yeah. So this is a great observation. There's all kinds of open source software out there that already exists. Um, Aave Compound. There's tons of money markets that support these features. So our job will not be to reinvent the wheel, but invite these uh, teams to uh, bring their products into the maker ecosystem in exchange for revenue share. Just, just to stick to this example, I mean, one of the one of the main differences between how the maker lending works versus Aave is that the collateral is really locked and not accessible for anybody else to borrow. So. If we if you want to stick with this thing that somebody's providing ETH, lends, uh, borrows DAI from that, and somebody else can then essentially unlock this this collateral and borrow borrow exactly this collateral. How how will this this work with the existing engine? Yeah, so this is a new engine. So this will be attached uh, to Maker uh, via uh, D3M. Ah, uh, so okay. This is completely outside of the current uh, Maker Core Vault engine. I see. So essentially, your 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 the, the Crimson cluster will have its own lending engine that is connected through to the Maker Core with a D3M, and then yeah, you will you will just do the stuff on your side. I see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you also looking to onboard um, collateral that Maker is currently unable to service, like smaller collaterals or um, yeah, our folks collaterals? Yeah, our focus is going to be uh, like high scale collateral. Um, we're not interested in supporting uh, tail end assets. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's like lots of other lending markets to do this. Uh, so like Aave supports a lot of different uh, smaller cap collateral. We're going to be focused on getting the biggest oomph for our punch. So um, we'll be focused on basically uh, wrap Bitcoin uh, or other Bitcoin alternatives if they uh, grow big. Um, ETH of course, and uh, staked ETH uh, derivatives. So these will be our primary uh, collaterals. And you know, if something else gets really big, we'll support it. But right now, those those uh, those two are um, like an order of magnitude larger than uh, the other smaller cap ERC twenties. Yeah, just stay away from some of those FTX collaterals, man. Like uh, mm -hmm. sold then W wrap BTC or some crap like that. Um, I'm joking, but uh, those things are a hot mess right now. One one thing, I mean, if we have a so regardless if this is make a call or whatnot. So if we if we if this applies to to Aave and Compound and whatever, if we have something that is connected to a D3M, uh, there is usually something that goes back as collateral. So in, on on the Aave case, we have a die that is then uh, basically the collateral backing the the die that is um, that is um, yeah. Um, yeah, basically backing the die that that got streamed through D3M. Uh, you probably want to have something in a similar fashion. My my question there is, what about the risk that then your cluster is taken with your dedicated lending engine? Um, how how will this how will this risk being distributed? So let's say somebody is not uh, somebody is uh, is reborrowing the ETH that was uh, provided as collateral in the first place. Uh, let's say this, um, yeah, this defaults. How is this this risk being handled, or this default being handled there? Uh, yeah. So to answer the first part, um, it will be exactly like uh, the Aave or Compound D3M, where you get back uh, basically an LP token that's a claim on uh, Dai in the pool uh, if and when it's available. Uh, so you can think of it identically to that. 
Um, for the risk, uh, yeah. So the the like in all things DeFi, everything needs to be over collateralized. So there's unless there is like a hack or I don't know, it's like let's say we have staked ETH and it goes to zero really quickly or something like that. You know, these are the same risks that are present in Maker. Uh, it's our goal to keep the risk profile to it's basically what makers is. Uh, that's sort of what we're shooting for. Um, there'll be some differences slightly, but we our goal is to make this the most secure we possibly can. And but you know, in this space, there's always going to be risks. You know, things can go to zero. It just it's the nature of the space. And um, what I was wondering is because you said that other people can then take the collateral and loan uh, or borrow the collateral. And I was wondering as a user, if th that's a very interesting risk profile. So I put up my ETH on your lending engine and for instance, take out DAI or, or whatever you, you offer or, uh, as, a, as an asset. And then like, do I control if other people have access to that? Like I can give them the permission to loan that or not? Because otherwise I'm presented with like a very unknown risk. Is that a trustworthy? borrower or not so how, how are you managing that risk yeah uh, yeah so this i mean this market's not for everybody so it is uh, a higher risk because we are loaning at the eth um i would say if you're not looking to loan at your collateral uh you'd probably be more interested in uh, using the maker core vaults uh so what what our goal is not to just sort of uh replace maker core vaults in every way what we want to do is address the uh, target uh, markets that are being underserved by Maker currently. So this is like for those users who don't mind lending out their collateral um, and they because they want to earn extra interest on it, there's nothing they can do if they want to stay in the Maker ecosystem, right? They have to use uh, these other lending engines. So what we want to do is just open the door to these users and bring them on board, get them inside the uh, Maker ecosystem, the Maker community. But um, like you'll aggregate all the borrowers, and then so like I'm not, I'm not dealing with one person who's loaning, like who's borrowing my ETH. But my risk is about like distributed over all the borrowers in the metadata, right? It's so not one on one. I mean, it's all pooled together. If that's what you're getting at, yeah. uh, it, it's you can think of it just like Aave or Compound. Yeah, with that in mind, uh, do you plan on going to the layer twos and also, you know, because of the dias, because the, the, the Aves and compounds, specifically Ave are uh, looking to do uh, pretty much just about every chain I can think of these days. So um, it should be easy for the Crimson cluster to be able to spin this up in uh, different uh, chains, correct? Or layers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we're very user focused, so we want to go to the chains that all the users are at. Uh, like, so a part of the prerequisite for this is the uh, developing work in uh, in Maker Core, um, which I'm personally working on right now, uh, which is sort of getting Maker uh, multi-chain. And once Maker supports these chains uh, and there's sort of uh, there's user demand, we can see that uh, we can deploy uh, an instance of this and along with maker teleport um we will be able to jump between chains so this is sort of the uh, ideal um idealized vision where uh the ui is no longer like i'm on this chain i need to get this chain and the user really needs to be concerned about this it's more like i want to take out a loan with this asset and i want the loan to go onto this other chain just do whatever it takes to get there and maker teleport is going to be the thing that uh, facilitates this. So this is uh, takes me to the uh, the cross chain apps that I've been hearing a lot about, which got has me excited. Actually, I can't wait for. I think the end users, you know, they they don't want to know what. I mean, obviously, they do want to know at the moment where what chain they're on, right? Because you have to. You don't have much of a choice. But eventually, down the road, I can envision a you know a time in our lives where we're not going to know if we are on you know optimism or uh, Arbitrum or layer one. So um, yeah, this is super exciting stuff. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about the uh, proposal of the Crimson cluster was that I noticed you you propose, uh, I believe about four individuals, including yourself. Uh, can you kind of give us your thinking behind why your cluster and perhaps even other clusters, because they all seem to follow the same kind of 
theory of having a small team. Kind of give us your your emphasis on why you were the first individual to propose a cluster and why you believe this works better as opposed to having a 10, 20 man team. Uh, yeah, uh, so the end game actually uh, prescribes this. They are uh, the proposer of the end game uh, wants the uh, MetaDAO clusters to be small teams that are mostly uh, contracting out to uh, ecosystem actors. Um, this is, I, I don't know the, I have, I have an okay idea of why uh, he wants to do that, um, but I, I think he'd probably be better served to answer the question of why that is. So we're uh, just following uh, the requirements of the end game. I, I believe uh, if I had to uh, place a bet on why that is, is because I think when you have a small uh, team of, you know, a handful of individuals, you kind of have, have skin in the game. Um, not only do they feel like every idea that they're sharing with you, Sam, um, is going to be heard, but also um, is going to have the ability to, you know, bring out, bring in the outside noise when needed, right? What I mean by outside noise, I mean the ecosystem actors, right? So if you need it, uh, a front end build, you might hire, you know, abc.io, what have you. Uh, so how, how are you guys thinking about that? Because, you know, I know you're an engineer. Are you planning on bringing another engineer, maybe two engineers and one business development person? Um, what are your thoughts behind that? And, and if it's only one engineer, how do you scale that to other, you know, layer twos and layer ones? Yeah, I think you laid it out pretty well. Um, we're looking at a well-rounded team so we can cover all the bases with the uh, MetaDAO administrative stuff. But yeah, it's going to be contracting and we're like we're already looking at a number of uh, potential ecosystem actors, uh, but we're at the beginning stages. So we're just doing preliminary research. Uh, but yeah, I think you laid it out pretty well, Frank. Um, one other thing though, a uh, cluster is not like, uh, and maybe this is a little pedantic, but like the cluster is not uh, the owner of the MetaDAO. We are, uh, I think it's better to think of it like the MetaDAO is contracting us to basically do operations. And it, potentially we could be uh, let go at some point, even if we are initially hired by the MetaDAO. Got it. Okay. Raphael. Hey, yeah. Just um, to be mindful of your time, because uh, I know that you have a hard stop in, in a quarter of an hour. I just want to touch on this. A canonical guy stuff because for me that's like super exciting and, and one of the things I'm I'm really bullish about. And maybe you can explain how this is radically different from what we already have, where Dai gets then bridged to Avalanche and then you have Dai.e or whatever. But I think the vision you have is is very different from that and I think much cleaner. So maybe you can can explain that to, uh, to me because I just heard it in Warsaw for the first time and I, I'd love to revisit that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so you're, yeah, you're right. Like uh, Dai is uh, bridged all over the place in uh, different capacities. Uh, the main differentiator on this stuff is security. So um, some bridges that like they have all kinds of different designs. And this is why we've seen so many hacks because some of them are just not very secure. So um, in order, and and the other thing is, uh, these these are basically just wrap tokens. So there's no maker has not deployed these. Uh, some random person has permissionlessly done it. Uh, so we have no say over who uses these bridges and uh, stuff like that. Um, in order to deploy uh, the maker uh, system as a whole on another chain, we need to be have like top confidence in the security, and so. So far, we've only uh, been doing using uh, roll-up native bridges, which are of the highest security, uh, because the roll-up itself is basically the same security as the uh, native bridge to it. So uh, all of our effort is uh, initially going to L2s. Uh, it's, it's potentially we could go to the other uh, L1s like uh, you know Polygon POS, uh, but uh, you know it remains to be seen. We're still a little ways out. Development is ongoing. And our initial targets are um, the L2s right now. It seems like everybody is converging on L2s anyways. I think even Polygon themselves have said that they're going to merge Polygon POS into uh, their ZK VM. So, I mean, if I had to take a bet, I, I think it's just going to be a ZK rollups and optimistic rollups, uh, you know, within the next couple of years. 
but but how does it work like how does maker have more control and more security about die on these chains versus a normal bridge um is it because then the maker engine is deployed on these chains and they kind of talk to each other or ah yes exactly um so uh maybe let's uh, step through this a bit um so one step, I guess you can call it one step above uh, wrap die is what we call canonical die, which is Maker has uh, sanctioned the use of this die. It, we've put our stamp of approval on it. We say it's, uh, you know, nothing's 100% safe, but we feel confident that it's uh, it's as secure as we can possibly make it. Um, the thing that the main difference is there is that uh, Maker governance has minting rights on it on L2. Now, uh, this doesn't really mean anything uh, right now, but what it allows us to do is uh, once we deploy uh, the accounting module, which is the VAT on these L2s, uh, we can then hook that into uh, this die that is sitting on L2, and then we can start, uh, you know, issuing debt, right? Um, so this is the entire maker engine that exists on L1 on this L2. You can't do that right now. So right now, if you want to take out a loan on maker, you can't just like, if you're on, say you have some OP tokens, right? You can't just uh, use maker on optimism right now. That doesn't exist. So that's what we're working towards deploying such that you don't even have to touch Ethereum at all if you want to take out a loan uh, against your OP tokens. And could I then... Um... Uh, for instance, I, let's say I have ETH on L, on ETH mainnet deposited, and uh, for some reason I want to take out Dai on uh, Starknet. Could I do that? Yeah. So the it, it's kind of two steps there, but yes, the user can kind of think of it like that, where they would I have some ETH on Ethereum mainnet, and I want to loan on uh, Starknet. Uh, that's how you should be thinking about. It. And the steps involved with that are you take the loan out on Ethereum, and then you you use uh, Maker Teleport. To teleport that die instantly to Starknet, and then you could just do the action in reverse. And to the end user, this is not going to be something they care about. It's again like this is all going to be abstracted away eventually. It's just going to be like I want a loan on this chain, and I have this asset. You know, do the give me the best fees possible to make this happen. But the main the main difference here would be that if I would my have my collateral on mainnet, then essentially the the die gets minted on mainnet, which means that there needs to be a, um, a main transaction as well. Uh, so this is not opening up and by that having a vault on mainnet as well with the dust that we have right now. And I think, I, I mean, I, I've been complaining about this not too long anymore because I kind of got used to that. But the, the main advantage of being on a level two from my perspective is with the lower transaction fees, we can have a lower dust as well on level twos. But for that, you need to lock up the collateral on level two. That's nothing you can do at level one because you're essentially, I mean, the, the, the vault still needs to be liquidatable on level one if the collateral is there, right? Uh, yeah, so um, it seems like something that will probably be moving around uh, the various L L2s. So uh, I think if you want an example where this doesn't touch Ethereum, um, well, maybe let's use the OP example, right? The OP optimism token is is probably going to be pretty constrained to the optimism environment. I don't see many reasons to bridge it to Ethereum. Uh, it's it's pretty L2 native uh, token that's probably going to be a decently high uh, market cap and usage. So you can take out a loan on optimism. Uh, the die would then be generated on optimism under that uh, MCD instance, and then it would be instantly uh, teleported to whatever chain Starknet, for example, you want to go to. None of the, In that example, there's no transactions on L1. I mean, there is not even a transaction on level one if you would uh, teleport it to level one, right? To main. You know, if you teleport to, if you want to target L one or that's your source, you do need to have uh, L one transactions. Yeah, to but, claim it essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. That's true. Any any idea when this is going to be not the future but uh, the reality? Um. I mean, I could say this is probably one of the most complex pieces. Uh, in DeFi right now. So it's going to take a little while. We need to make sure it's like secure. So like many, 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 many rounds of review, many rounds of audits. And so like, don't yeah. expect this anytime soon. Like we're just rolling out the fast withdrawals, uh, maker teleport. Um, so, 
you know, getting full maker support on all these chains, you know, it's, we're looking at a time frame of like a year or so, like it's not, it's not going to be tomorrow, but yeah, you know, that's what bear markets are for, right? For building. Exactly. We had exactly this phrase last week with Curveberry. So, yeah, mm -hmm. but the priority for actually working on that stuff is not going to change just because of the, the whole end game direction that we are moving in right now, right? This is still a focus topic for protocol engineering to move on with this thing, even if it's if it takes another year to get there. Yeah, I mean, the end game was just passed. So we're still like uh, determining uh, where exactly all the priorities are with everything. Um, so yeah, I can't really comment on that, but yeah, it, it's, it's up there, I would say. Obviously right now we're going through a tough bear market, uh, a very possible long winter. Uh, with that in mind, I mean, what are your biggest worry when it comes to the DeFi ecosystem? Are there things that keep you up at night with regards to MakerDAO and with regards to the DeFi ecosystem itself? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, Maker's pretty rock solid. I like, I, <sighs> I'm not even sure what, what could go possibly wrong. Like maybe some massive ETH collapse in price or something. I don't know. The U.S. government gets super hostile towards uh, Ethereum as a whole. You know, MakerDAO right now is full of proposals. And I, I you know, I've seen you participate in, in some of the discussions with other community members with regards with the direction that these proposals, which are based on the uh, PSM, the PEG Stability Module, uh, specifically the USDC uh, PSM. Uh, what are your thoughts there with regards to, you know, the fact that in the last, I believe, uh, three trading sessions, so 72 hours, we've seen that PSM get drained a bit uh, because of the USDT curve three pool, which is a die USDC USDT pool. Um, what are your thoughts behind the whole, you know, proposal things? There's, there's a plethora of proposals right now. Uh, I'm not going to go over them, but uh, you know who they are. What are you th What are you thinking there? Uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, th all this uh, stuff should be automated into some sort of uh, strategy. Uh, I think Seb's put up some ALM strategy. Basically, we have X number of uh, fiat stablecoin backed uh, DAI. You know, whatever that number is, uh, maybe four billion, four point five billion right now. And we percentage wise, we just allocate this into uh, various uh, different things. So we we have some number we don't want to cross, say 20% or something uh, of uh, USDC, which is the most liquid. Uh, so it supports the peg the most, um, but we don't necessarily need maximum liquidity on the whole amount all the time. So, uh, you know, putting some of it into treasuries uh, or, you know, less liquid stable coins like uh, GUSD um, and just sort of, ideally we want to automate this entirely. Like it should just like, we shouldn't be asking ourselves every now and then um, what, yeah, should we be concerned about the crunching uh, USDC liquidity? No, it should just automatically determine, okay, USDC is running out a bit. Let's pull some out of the GUNE, um uh, supply and move it here automatically, basically, to try and uh, maintain all these things at once. <clears throat> With regards to MIP81, do you envision um, uh, a smart contract? I know this has been discussed, and uh, I'm pretty sure you would also agree that a smart contract would be smart for the MIP81, which essentially takes you know US, USDC out of the PSM and uh, puts it into coin, Coinbase rewards. Uh, for you know, 150 basis points uh, rewards. Um, do you envision something where we can kind of automate that, and so not to dry out the entire USDC P PSM by having a line, a gap, and making sure that there's some kind of parameter where we say, okay, uh, die holders uh, always have the ability to know that there's USDC in the system, and that threshold is half a million or a billion, what have you. Do you believe something like that is uh, possible? And I think Tim wants to talk a little bit about the DSR mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's ideal. And yeah, I would rather have the uh, funds uh, Coinbase deal uh, in a smart contract as opposed to under custody. Uh, it's just, you know, why trust when you can have a permissionless smart contract? So that, that just seems like a better way to do it if we can. And uh, they said uh, we have immediate liquidity on it anyway. So yeah, it just to, for the getting it done quickly sort of uh, mentality, uh, I think 
it's okay to have a governance vote to maybe move some funds back into the PSM if we need to. But ideally, yeah, this should all be automated. Like we should move money in and out of these uh, more and less liquid instruments just completely automatically. But, you know, there's only so many dev resources. So I'm more a fan of, you know, let's get it done. Let's start earning interest and then we'll make it better over time. Yeah. And to be fair, MIP 81 wasn't written to be that technical, right? So um, to, 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 to your uh, um, idea there, you know, it's all fair. Uh, we should definitely uh, get it done and get it across the finish line and start earning some rewards. So hopefully that will happen. Uh, I know you're, you're short on time here. But um, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, you know, unless you want to stay longer, then you're more than welcome, and we can keep going. Sorry, I, I would if I could. I have a hard stop, but uh, yeah, it's really good to be here. Yeah, man, and uh, thank you for coming on board. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you soon in the next uh, next know, week. 20, next week, twenty-four months, twenty-four yep, months, yep. because it's going to be a long winter, a lot of building. Crimson Cluster has so much to do on their, you know, so much on their plate. So you definitely got to come back on, Sam. Appreciate having you here. As always, be kind, love one another, and keep building. And stay hydrated. Drink tea.